More often than not, I say that when people think about food, they think about either their favorite meal that they've cooked or perhaps their favorite meal that they've been out to. And more often than not, Ken, I think people talk about an experience with an independent restaurant because those are those moments where you feel like you're treated that little bit more special, right? It's often not necessarily the food they're remembering. They're remembering the experience. They're remembering the way that restaurant and their team made them feel. And I think that really is something which is the heart of hospitality in all honesty. It's tough because again, why do restaurateurs open up restaurants? They love food, they love hospitality, they love seeing the joy in their customers' faces. In my world of digital off-premise um, channels, they get to create the food, they don't get to see the customers' joy in their faces, right? And so it, what kind of experience are they getting from it? And so you have to get to a place to actually help the restaurant understand that actually by going down this pathway, by actually embracing the fact that customers want to experience their food sometimes, sometimes outside of the dining room, is actually something that's gonna be an incremental source of value to your business. Welcome everyone to another eye-opening episode of The Practical Optimist. I can't tell you how exciting it is to see our subscriber numbers continue to increase with each new episode. And the cool thing is that now amazing leaders from all around the world are contacting me to be a guest on our show. And that's exactly what we're all about, meeting new people and hearing their inspirational stories no matter where they are, about leadership, life, and what made them who they are today. I'm your host, Ken Schmidt, founder and CEO of Turning Point Executive Search and author of the book, The Practical Optimist, which is available at your local bookstore and online. Today's guest is Carl Orsborn. He's someone I've known for a number of years. And after growing up in the UK, he spent 18 years at BP, the large oil and gas company, before getting into the retail and restaurant industry. Not the most obvious career path for sure, but Carl's story is full of uncomfortable situations, global leadership, advanced education, becoming a best-selling author, and ultimately following his career matrix by driving the digital transformation within the restaurant industry. Who would have thought that data and food would be such a fantastic pairing? So enjoy this lively conversation as Carl Orsborn takes us through the intersection of leadership and life. Carl, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm very excited to have you as part of the podcast. I know we've been uh, colleagues for a number of years now, and you you spoke at our our uh, SMLA group a number of years ago as well. But uh, today I'm joined by Carl Arsborn. He's up in Orange County, which for those of you that are not in California, this is kind of the Southern California region, uh, kind of close to Disneyland. So uh, thank you for joining us this morning. It's great to be here, Ken. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, so I understand as we were talking offline beforehand that you're you're actually out in the Midwest today at one of the uh, many conferences that you typically attend. How has it been so far? Yeah, over in Chicago, and it's it's crazy. My feet are killing me. Let's put it that way. It, the the National <laughs> Restaurant Show has something like seventy thousand people attend, all from not just over the U.S. but are from around the world, and. There are a lot of exhibitors here. There's a lot of uh, people that are sharing their wisdom and uh, hopefully selling their products and services as well, I suspect. No, that's great. I'm looking forward to kind of delving more into that. And one of the one of the reasons that I wanted to uh, chat with you on the podcast here also is there's so much discussion out there about AI and technology and SaaS and software and everything and how it's disrupting so many different industries. But you don't hear much about how it's disrupting the world of restaurants, right? The food world, whether, whether it's delivery, whether it's, you know, walk up, whether it's QSR, uh, and having grown up in a house where my dad was a Jack in a box franchisee. And I've, I've been around restaurants for as long as I can remember, uh, even seeing, you know, uh, was a national restaurant news, uh, you know, on, on, uh, my kitchen table as a kid, you know, month in and month out. Yeah. You know, I'm really excited to talk about kind of where, what you're seeing as the impact from technology and even AI, perhaps, you know, on dynamic pricing and the restaurant world. So it'll be a, I think a lively conversation for sure. We've got lots to talk about. Um, yeah. Digital disruption in the restaurant industry is what I've been focusing a lot of my time and attention on over these last few years. So, yeah, looking forward to seeing where this conversation goes. Yeah, great. Wonderful. Well, and, and let me start off by asking, so did you did you grow up in a house? I know you're, you're from the UK. You're from England. Did you grow up in a house where either restaurant or retail was a part of the of your surroundings where your parents or, or uncles and aunts in that business? You know what? No. Unusually, most people when you ask them that question, they go, "Yes, absolutely," and I'll I'll tell you my story. My my um, 
closest real memory to understanding the restaurant industry was largely through my parents' very close friends, uh, Ramo and Grace, that ran an Italian restaurant in North London. And these guys had come across from Italy. They didn't really speak much English, but they were the most hospitable hosts you could ever imagine. I always remember their, their, them just inviting us in, treating us as if we were kings and queens and princes coming together. And they had once took us over to their family on the shores of Lake Como in North Italy, where again, I was amidst this huge big table where everyone was speaking to Italian to each other. And it was just the, the theater of dining, the joy of food and the culinary experience you can have that just always lended itself to me to think, wow, this is such a, an exciting space to be. And also the, the pleasure that you'll see on their faces in serving food. And it's interesting for me when I think now to my world of when I'm talking about restaurants and technology and hospitality and digital hospitality, because in many ways, restaurants are in that same mindset as Raymo and Grace back then, because they're thinking, well, how does technology really help me when it comes to hospitality? You know, I want to see the joy on my customers' faces still. And then there's this delivery channel that I don't even really get to see it. And I'm making less money through it. So why on earth do I need to do that, right? Uh, all of these things are, are resistance points, are causing points of friction in the average restaurant's mindset. And that's really what I set out to do a number of years ago, is to help them see that actually hospitality can still exist in a new way, much like I experienced um, when I was a child at Raymond and Grace's. That's a great story. I love that. Yeah, that's one of the things about this podcast that I, that I I really enjoy having folks like you that are willing to share kind of that that part of the story. Because like you said, a lot of people usually say, yes, I grew up around that industry or I had some exposure to that. And that's what kind of I got my first taste of it, you know, based on my parents or what have you. Uh, but that's that's a great that's a great story because then you had it. Obviously, it was the it was the kind of the, the familial, but also the you know the collaborative you know type of a, of a dynamic that you had with those folks with Ramo and Grace, and that kind of did that provide that exposure just to kind of say, hey, have, have you been considered or looked into this kind of a sector? And uh, before that, it sounds like you really hadn't. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's it's for me. I think the it's it, it's an interesting thing when you think about food generally because everyone. Everyone has a connection to food, whether they've worked in the industry or not. Everyone has their experience, their favorite memory of their favorite restaurants. And more often than not, I say that when people think about food, they think about either their favorite meal that they've cooked or perhaps their favorite meal that they've been out to. And more often than not, Ken, I think people talk about an experience with an independent restaurant because those are those moments where you feel like you're treated that little bit more special Right? It's often not necessarily the food they're remembering. They're remembering the experience. They're remembering the way that restaurant and their team made them feel. And I think that really is something which is the heart of hospitality, in all honesty. That's great. No, I love that. And I think when you when you think about, like you said, the, the experience that you have, um, there's a reason why, you know, the Food Network has been on as long as it has and why my wife and I watch pretty much every you know reality competition food show as well. You know, whether you're watching someone cook, whether you're watching people congregate and get together right around it, um, you know, there's something about food that really is kind of that universal language, if you will, to your point. Uh, and it really is. It really kind of drives a lot of experiences at, at all ages, young as well as you know older. And, and of course, during during college, university as well. So, so you you spent a long time working at BP, right? So you you got into that company. Obviously, it wasn't the first job you had out of school, but um, but you were there you know for a very long time for over eighteen years. Did you have any goal when you joined them to eventually move into that restaurant or retail part of the no, organization? No, or did I, that also just kind of unfold organically? No, I didn't. So a lot of my um, late school, early college years were in the retail space. Right. So I was very much customer facing environments. My part time roles were selling suits to uh, business people or being in a hardware store managing my biggest management job for a number of years was actually when I was 17. I had to manage something like 15 to 20 cashiers in a hardware store and uh, deal with disgruntled customers. And so I, <laughs> I, I grew up in this in customer facing environments. Um, but you might then think, well, BP, oil and gas company, how, how on earth did you end up there? And. When I was when I left college, I, I did a, a three month stint across the US. Just uh, I had a, I bought a ticket into Miami, and then three months later there was a ticket out of San Francisco with no plan in between. But I wanted to use that time just to enjoy post college life, post university life, um, and it was really there which I realized that I liked the spontaneity, and I liked variety. 
those are two things that were central to my kind of interest, but I hadn't really figured out which industry I wanted to be in. So BP at this time had a, a graduate program that allowed me to spend one year in one part of the business and then another year in another part and then another year in another part. So my first year was actually up in the, uh, the very north of Scotland in Aberdeen in the upstream part of the business. And upstream is the part of the business where you extract oil from, in this case, the, the North Sea. And I was doing a lot of commercial analytics to determine whether we should spend millions into drilling a hole in one particular part of uh, just west of the Shetlands. And that's why I'm now hiding out in California, because my math isn't that good. I probably made a mistake back then. Who knows? Um, and then <laughs> my, my second year was um, further south in England, in Hertfordshire, in, in the Air BP, the aviation part of BP, which sells kerosene to the airlines and to the private airfields. But that was um, as part of the e-commerce team. And interestingly for me, that whole uh, time was, you know, I think I joined nine days after 9-11. Oh wow! Of course, had a you know terrible, horrific effect on many different um, industries as a result of that. But the aviation industry, in particular, because everyone stopped flying for a period of time, and so my team uh, went from something like eight or nine people down to myself and my manager. So I had great exposure to how to support an e-commerce business, even in um, the aviation world. And this was supporting the private airlines more than anything, um, and that was great. And then my third role was actually in the trading floor in central London, uh, supporting traders moving butane and propane across Northwest Europe. And so I'd get woken up in the middle of the evening at 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. about a barge, you know, hidden ground somewhere off the, sh uh, the shores of Rotterdam and having to figure that out. So you just think about those first three years of my career were basically in completely different roles, in completely different business environments. And of course, you come out of that, you're thinking, well, what were the things that you particularly liked? And... I didn't really like the, the long-term nature of upstream, the fact that whatever work you did doesn't necessarily materialize until sometime later. Sure, sure. And I didn't necessarily like the day-to-day the -day routine nature of the, um, the, the trading operations world, where very much more than anything, you're trying to make sure you just don't drop a ball. Ultimately, a trade has happened. You want to make sure the ship arrives, they pick up their goods, they deliver it to wherever they're taking it to, and you're happy. It's only when you make a mistake that you get found out. So I didn't really like that side. But I did like the marketing, the refining marketing angle of BP's business because it did have variety. It did have that kind of aspect where there were customers involved, which went back to my pre-college years. And so it was shortly after that when I joined a, um, a team of real best practice experts in the retail part of our business, the gas station, the convenience start part of our business. And uh, I was part of a team that was supporting the 26,000 gas stations around the BP world with a lean retail um, methodology that McKinsey had given us, which was about trying to improve the customer experience, drive costs down through things like labor models and waste productivity for the food business, improving category management, IT principles, thinking about pricing. And I was the most junior member of this team, helping them understand, as in helping each of these different businesses around the BP uh, retail family, understand how things could be done better. So I was learning a huge amount about change management as well, because you can imagine every one of these retail leaders are going, who the heck are these team coming in from London <laughs> exactly. telling us how to run our business? Right. Which was wonderful, really good experience. But my boss said to me, Carl, if you ever want to run one of these retail businesses yourself in your future, you've got to get your hands dirty. You've got to get some operational experience. Do you want to go to Krakow in Poland or San Diego in California to do that? And in about half a second, I said, San Diego is fine, Frederick. That, that would be great for me. Thank you very much. And I packed my bags and off I went to San Diego to then deploy that very same program. But now in the gas stations themselves, in the Arco and PMs, where I would then be having not to convince the leaders of these businesses, but actually the site managers, the GMs of these locations. So here is this funny talking brick come along talking to them about change management and why they need to deploy their labor differently. And I was doing it at that level and that was great. And then I went on to become a franchise consultant more in the routine business. And I was starting to establish that, that experience. And you know, fast forward to 2015, I then got to come back and run the retail business myself uh, and be responsible for a billion dollars worth of sales. So my, my journey kind of started in that wow. way, you know, to come out of the grad scheme, get into retail, have a wonderful experience very early in life at the age of 25 to come to California and, the, and ultimately achieve the dream I always had to do, which was to be able to run a business unit in a company the size of BP. 
That's amazing. I mean, to, to have done those things, uh, not only in, in one location, but in multiple locations, you said obviously in England, up in Scotland, and then in the US as well. You know, that's, 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 and any one of those regions would have been difficult, but to do it in all those and then move around like you did, it's pretty incredible. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, what comes to mind for me as I hear your, your journey, your story is, you know, the, the level of confidence or maybe somewhat naivety, you know, or just kind of the, the pure support that you have from your boss to take on that role, to come to San Diego, you know, in your mid twenties, like you said, and, and operate, work with all these different, um, you know, locations, AMPMs, what, what, what made you think that you could make it work? How did you, what, what, what drove that, that confidence or that, that, um, I don't know, the knowledge that, Hey, you'd figure it out. Oh, I didn't have the confidence I'd figure it out. I was scared all the way through. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> uh, um, but I think, I, I think you always need an incessant need of, of curiosity and a willingness to learn. And I mean, ultimately those three years in that grad program, and I, the reason I went into that detail is, you literally got to the end of like maybe nine months and you go, oh, I figured this out. But two months later, you're moving on to your next gig, right? So <laughs> yep. it, it teaches you to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And it mm -hmm. teaches you about asking the right questions to learn as quickly as you possibly can. And even in, across my 18 years with BP, I did 11 different roles mm -hmm. wow. in different, you know, different capacities. And probably the one that made, made me most uncomfortable was when um, I just finished the pricing manager role, which was the most political job of my life, you know, because everyone's got an opinion on gas prices. <laughs> and, and I was moving in to run the, the performance and planning team, which was like the finance uh, performance team for our UK retail business. And I had a whole bunch of chartered accountants working for me, people that knew financial analytics really, really well. I hadn't got a clue. And I mentioned earlier, my math wasn't necessarily the strongest, Ken. So I was like, wow, this is really going to push me to the limit. But I had asked to get some experience in finance because, again, with that aspiration of one day wanting to run um, and be responsible for a business, uh, I thought, well, at this stage of my career, if I don't get some financial experience now, it's going to hold me back later. And I'm really glad I did it. I didn't necessarily enjoy it as much as some other roles, and I didn't necessarily feel as comfortable as, as perhaps in some other roles. But boy, was it a great experience. Well, and I think having, I mean, that, that again, that, that wherewithal, that mindset to say, I, I'm going to need this experience. I'm going to need this knowledge base, A, just for your own ability to do the job, but B, probably for, for credibility also. You know, the, there's no better way to uh, ingratiate yourself with other people around you that are, you know, doing different jobs that are smarter, that are more technical, whatever it might be, than to say, hey, I want you to teach me, help me understand how you do what you do so we can kind of speak the same language but again a lot most you know folks in their mid to late 20s are not going to have that mindset at all they're just happy to get a paycheck and just kind of focus on the job in front of them they're not thinking that far ahead which is which is impressive that you had that that more global and more kind of uh future looking if you will approach to that that's impressive now so what were your did your were there certain things that you remember about growing up that really helped to ingrain that in you about thinking thinking several steps ahead or, you know, finding ways to, to connect with those around you, whether professionally or personally? Mm. It's a good question. I, look, I often credit my, both my parents in different ways. My, my father worked for local government in London and he um, supported tens of thousands of employees from everyone that was supporting the, the refuse collection through to the, the folks that were managing the swimming pools, the public swimming pools in London. But he, one of his more, um, uh, proud moments was organizing one of the largest shows for uh, people in London where we'd have the likes of James Brown come and perform to the concerts of tens of thousands of people and I think in many ways his organizational mindset to really think about okay we're going to organize a show a year and a half from now what are the things that we need to have in place over the course of the next 18 months to get ready for that really was kind of inbuilt into me from a very young age and so I've always had a, a love for organizing and having a level of structure and process um, and then my mum is probably one of the more sociable, uh, networking orientated people that would always be the center of the party and always wants to hear someone's story and be inquisitive about them. And I credit her for encouraging me to take a drama class and, and study for my the qualification uh, at the age of 16 in the UK as a GCSE, but to, to do a drama GCSE. And uh, that was fantastic because it really enabled me to get out of my 
comfort zone again we talk about comfort already but to to really um overcome a level of shyness to drive a level of confidence you know i i grew up uh, being a musician you know I, I played the piano i was taught by a blind lady at the age of six and music was you know flowing through my veins all the way through to my mid-20s when i was performing at people's weddings uh like as a little side gig and so i think there's something about um just being amongst people asking questions entertaining and supporting but also having that backbone of organization process and structured thinking. And even to this day, I don't think I've sent it to you, Ken. I'll have to send it to you at some point. When I'm coaching young professionals, I um, I share with them a tool, which I call a career matrix. And the career matrix is a little bit like this future back thinking that we've been talking about. It's like saying, well, what do you want from your career? You know, And sometimes it's not that they want to be the CEO, but it's something that they want to become more accomplished in. But this whole career matrix is also trying to say, what do you want from your life longer term? You know, and when I was in my early 20s, I had three objectives. I wanted to run a business unit. I wanted to work overseas. And I wanted to someday do my MBA. All right. So I had those three things that would be wow. on my career matrix. Now, in those early 20s, I didn't have a career matrix. Right. But I, I, the, the, this was formulating in my mind. And the idea of it was as you go through each job from your career, you list down the competencies and, um, and things that you liked and disliked about your experiences, the, the job type and the skill sets that you were um, able to experience from that particular job. And then as you start to formulate a view as to what you want to be when you grow up, if you, if you will, you actually then to say, well, what do, in my case, a business unit leader have in their armory? And they'd have typically some financial experience. Well, guess what? I use that to say, well, at some point between now and the point where I get there, I need to get some financial experience. So what did I put out when I'm speaking to people? I said, well, at some point, I'd like to get some financial experience. And so I'm a big believer that what you put out into the world and what you push out to say, this is the kind of direction I want to go to. And these are some of the experiences that I want to have ultimately end up somehow the universe aligns to being able to enable them to happen. And that's seemingly what's happened to me. Now, part of that is also being able to be very clear and articulate about what you want and how you're willing to ask for help but i think there's another side of it as well being willing to help others on their journey as well right so it's not a quid pro quo but it's about having that mindset of helping others and then trusting in the universe to help you too hey by the way thanks again for listening if you like what you're hearing in today's discussion please subscribe to our channel or leave us a review and we'd love for you to share this episode with your friends and family and now back to our show I think you and I are very much aligned in those areas too. When you were talking about your career matrix, it reminds me of, you know, aside from doing all the recruiting that we do, I also do a fair amount of, you know, kind of free career coaching, if you will, folks, especially those that are senior executives that have never been in job search mode before, right? And they jobs have always found them or colleagues always took them along from one uh, post to the next. And a lot of folks I talk to that have 20, 30 years of experience find themselves for the first time, you know, in an active job search mode. And I do what, what, what I call the, the get to versus have to which is very similar to what you talked about in the career, in the career um, matrix, right? Where make a list, think about the roles that you've had over the last, whatever, five, 10 years. And what are the things that you got to do? What are the things that you really gravitated towards that you really were excited about that got you up in the morning, got you all jazzed up? Those are the things that you want to really maximize and optimize in whatever that next you know, job is going to be. And then on the flip side of that same page, look at the things that you have to do. Right. There's always something, there's part of every job that you don't like, and all, no matter who it is, even if you run your own company, right? Um, there's still parts where you're like, oh, I got to do this. It's not my favorite, but it has to get done. So make a list of, of the have to's as well. And then as you're looking for new positions or new teams to be part of, make sure that you're truly focusing on the get to part, that you're maximizing that and minimizing the have to's. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself in a very unhappy position you know, with your next role. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it, it's that there, there, there's many different ways to be able to get to the same outcome, but it does require that level of self reflection, that self awareness. It does. I agree. I agree. Really yeah. Think about it. I, I often say to folks that have had the shock of losing a role or being made redundant in some way to use, use that time well, you know, A, to take a break, first of all, to not worry about it. Yeah. And then B, also then to take some time just to reflect because it actually is a gift. It's mm -hmm. a real gift to really be able to take some time to be able to think about uh, what you want to do next. Now, of course, everyone has their own individual financial priorities to sure. see how, how different paths to get, to get there. To that. Yeah. But um, 
use that time well and wisely and, and self-reflection is a big part of it. Yeah. Well, I think it was number three on that list that you talked about it in your early twenties. Number three, I think you said was to earn an MBA, right? Yeah. Um, and you did, and you did that. You went back in your, I guess, early thirties, right? Uh, after being with, with a BP for a few years. And I'm always fascinated and impressed by people that are able to, cause it's easy to say in your early twenties, when you finish up university, you finish up college and you say, great, I'm going to get some experience and I'll go back and get my MBA later. A lot of people say that actually doing it is a whole nother story, right? Mm. Because you get into that role, you're earning money, you're going through a career transition or you're, or you're moving up in the world and you know, up that corporate ladder. Uh, sometimes you're starting a family. So many things can easily get in the way of truly going back and getting that advanced degree. Um, but you're one of the few folks that, has, that was able to do it. So were you working full-time at BP and then doing your MBA at night or talk about yeah. that, that uh, experience? Well, first of all, it had been on my personal development plan at BP, which is a template that we used for all of our career conversations for probably seven or eight years before it actually happened. So again, talk about putting stuff out into the universe. So everyone <laughs> that I ever reported to or my mentors and, and, and the like, they knew that this was something that was important to me. And I think there's a, a difference here between what happens in Europe and uh, what happens in the US when it comes to at least MBAs. You know, I think there's a there's certainly a case for the more technical and scientific disciplines to get masters and PhDs earlier on in your, your development. But for business, I always was in the mindset of saying, what's the point of getting more schooling if I've got no real life experience to apply this stuff to? And, and it, it was never a question for me to go and do an MBA straight after my, my business undergrad degree, right? So I, I did a business undergrad degree, but for me, it would, be, it would have been rather repetitive to have gone straight into it. But they cost, they cost a lot of money. And so I had always thought, well, let's put this out here. Let's show my value and, and, and demonstrate to BP that if they believed in me as a future leader in this organization, they would invest in me as well. Now, they invested in me in terms of an expat contract to San Diego, which was very, very much appreciated. Um, but then some years later, I was in that finance team I, I was mentioned, where my, the, the, the head of finance, the CFO, if you will, for that business, um, had gone to London Business School, and he had seen my interest in doing it. And so he was incredibly supportive of me being able to take this on. So BP sponsored my executive MBA, to do alongside probably the most challenging role that I was ever working in within the company, which was running this performance and planning team wow. um, for a retail business. And so, yeah, I had to do that. Um, I had obviously a very uh, understanding and willing wife in, in Alicia to also recognize that for, I don't know, um, it, would, it would probably be something like um, three to four hours every night, um, at least 16 to 20 hours at the weekend um, dedicated to this activity. Wow. BP would give me a de um, one day every two weeks to go to some, some of the classes. And uh, it was tough. It was very tough to be able to do it. But what gets you through it is that there's about 80 others that are also there with you in the class that, quite honestly, many of them had far busier lives than me, doing perhaps even bigger <laughs> jobs, had young families to manage and, and the like. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to complain. If you guys can make this happen... Um, I'm going to make it happen. And, and it was such a wonderful experience. It really it really was because they were also intellectually curious. They also were running very you know impressive careers in various different verticals. And what it taught me, and, and somewhat um, somewhat surprisingly for me that I just didn't trigger on uh, until this point in my career, was the importance of networking. Because in BP, a company the size of BP, you know, the, net, the idea of networking was, well, you want to go and work for this department next? Well, go and network with the department next door. Or maybe sure. next time you can go down to this other office, you know, 100 miles south of here. The idea of networking outside was, oh, you don't want to message that because they're all going to think you're going to want to leave the company. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and so every, every week, I'd be around these 80 different individuals in different businesses, in different industries and verticals that had aspirations for their own career and had entrepreneurial fervor. It was a fantastic experience. I mean, it really meant a lot to learn that networking was super important. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't just do the course. I then became the president of the social committee. Uh, and of, course then, you, of course you did. You can't just do the, yeah, the I, basic, I can't just bare do the minimum. <laughs> well, I was, I was feeling guilty because I didn't have young children to raise. So <laughs> right, right, I had to exactly. like, look out for these guys. And, you know, by doing that, I, my proudest moment, would you believe, after it all, was the very last class where every single member had signed this lovely um, certificate, which they framed 
to say thank you, Carl, for pulling together a series of 20, 30 events over the couple of years, which have allowed us to create lifelong friendships amongst each other. And, you know, it, it really wow. meant powerful. the world to me that I was able to support them again, using some of those organizational skills yeah, right. and power networking that we talked about earlier. And the, and the skills but from your dad as well. I mean, having seen him, you know, organize those big events that you talked that's about, right. you know, in, in London as well. I mean, that's, I mean, who would have thought that, you know, in your early days would then fast forward and really compel you, but also help you excel right in this role during your MBA program. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and and it does teach you a lot about being comfortable with uncomfortable again, because that I was by no means the smartest person in that classroom, but you found yourself on certain units and certain areas where you'll be stronger than others. And when it comes to organizing events or when it comes to being able to own a room and, and, and network, people would look to me to support. But when it came to some complex algorithm or, you know, detailed elasticity study in some way, you know, I would have to rely on some other folks. And I think that's OK. It's a, it's, it's I agree. to know, know where your strengths are, know where your weaknesses are, know where you need help, because there's no one person that can do it all. If they can, you know, good for them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or if they can, they're getting only three hours in, uh, asleep a night like Elon Musk. Right. And right. And that might not be also not the healthiest <laughs> thing in the world. Yeah. What comes to mind when I say the word disruption? Most people think about some newfangled device or a cool new app, but as the founder of an executive search firm, what comes to mind for me is people. Because at the end of the day, there wouldn't be any apps or smart devices or streaming services if the people in charge don't embrace disruption. And let's face it, finding truly disruptive and innovative leaders is really hard these days. That's why I started Turning Point Executive Search back in 2007. Across the country, our clients turn to us for introductions to high-performing disruptors, who have new ideas and a different way of seeing the world. And it's these same leaders that ultimately take their businesses to the next level. Let us help you find the talent that will help your business become the next disruptor. And now back to our conversation. Well, so so I'm, I'm curious, so you, so you were there at BP for 18 years. Let's fast forward to the end of that tenure. Yeah. I'm curious because you, you've recently written two books, right? Uh, and the most recent one is, you know, Paths to Digital Maturity. Um, and it's all about digital, the digital restaurant, what's happening with analytics and bringing mm -hmm. that into the restaurant space. But I'm curious, towards the end of your, of your tenure, so this is, I think, 2018, is that right, when you left right. BP? Okay. Um, were you starting at that point to think about writing a book about, um, I know podcasts weren't even really barely around back then, so that wasn't on the radar screen, but writing the books or eventually wanted to become a, a co-founder of a company, was that starting to, to you know kind of creep into your mind at that point? So back to the career matrix. So I, mm -hmm. I gave you an outline of some of the things I wanted to achieve from my career, still out there on my career matrix to, to this day, is to write a West End or a Broadway musical. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Is, okay. You know, kind of crazy. <laughs> but I had this idea of thinking, well, look, Alicia and I don't have children, but I always had this idea of leaving a legacy into the world with some form of creative art, some mm -hmm. creative work, something that would stay, live beyond me, if you will. And um, I guess the book came through a little later on my journey from uh, after BP. So I, I absolutely wasn't leaving BP thinking, you know what, I'm going to go and write a book. Um, what I was thinking about then was, I want to utilize all the experience and knowledge that I've been able to amass in a company as good as BP and be able to deploy it in an environment that was a bit faster to make decisions and an environment that was yearning for innovation a little more than an industry like C stores. And so um, I got involved with Kitchen United at that point, which is one of the emerging ghost kitchen companies, um, which had just received funding from Google Ventures. And I was brought on to be able to build out the operational model for, for that company and, and scale it. And ghost kitchens, for your listeners that if they aren't aware, are, 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 are restaurants without a front of house. Yeah, it's a kitchen which is cooking and, um, and preparing food for the sole purpose of delivery or, or pickup. And so we were developing this concept and, and speaking to restaurants of large chains as well as independents and smaller to sell them this idea of, of why this is something to be excited about and why to be interested. And a lot of restaurants coming back to the very first conversation we had today we're looking at this as technology as something that didn't seem necessary and they were thinking well how on earth am i ever going to be able to um really get restaurants to be excited about this and i said to my co-author meredith sandland who was the former chief development officer for taco bell who also worked with me at kitchen united i said wouldn't it be great if we could get them a book 
just to help them understand this isn't the evil VCs or the evil tech companies making this happen, but actually it's their very guests, their very customers that are yearning for better ways of being able to have convenience driven to them, much like they're experiencing in other industries like retail and travel and the like. Sure, sure. Um, and she said, great, Carl. Yeah, go for it. Go, go on Amazon, find, find the book. We'll, we'll get them to put. All right. All right, Meredith. And then about three minutes later, after a few search pages on Amazon, I said, I don't think a book exists. Mm, yeah, right. And, and that's where the genesis of the book started. So we, after we left Kitchen United, um, we set about writing this book, um, or at least the outline for the book. And this was early 2021. Okay. And, well, the, actually late 2020, early 2021. And then the book came out in the summer of 2021. Where you might have noticed there was a pandemic. <laughs> Just a few things there. going on globally at that point. Yeah. Um, and talk about timing things well, uh, because every restaurant, for all intents and purposes, ha- either had shut down or had become a ghost kitchen, right? They right. were servicing their food for the sole purpose of having it delivered. And restaurants needed to very quickly become digitized. They very quickly needed to embrace the off premise channel and they were playing catch up super, super quick. So the first book is called Delivering the Digital Restaurant, Your Roadmap to the Future of Food. And it was very much centered on the why. Why to treat digitization seriously? Why to see off premise as a channel of real optimized opportunity for them going forwards? And to tell the stories of um, those that are doing it well. We interviewed over 100 different business leaders, both in restaurants and technology, that had been building up their businesses to this point to be able to really thrive in an environment as difficult as the pandemic. And so the book went on to become an international bestseller. You know, we've just signed the rights over to the uh, the Romanian Restaurant Association, would you believe? Oh, wow. Amazing. Romanian. Um, Romanian. <laughs> I'm, sure that, I'm sure that was on your career. Uh, that was on the list. Well. That was definitely on the career matrix. Uh, get the <laughs> attention of the Romanian Restaurant Association. Um, so, but yeah, it became a bestseller. We got a bunch of awards from it. And, and probably more importantly to the, the, the tonality of today's conversation is it was very, very helpful in rebranding my personal brand. I came from an oil and gas company. Yes, I worked in sea stores for 15 years, but when people see BP, they think oil and gas. And so I had a, a, a you know period of time at Kitchen United, which was a restaurant technology type of concept, if you will. Um, and the book enabled me to now establish myself as a thought leader in this space. And so as a result of that, I then ended up on a number of different conferences, talking on panels, moderating panels, speaking directly to private and public organizations. And it was great. It was a wonderful way to enable me to be able to project my my thoughts about what's happening in our industry forwards. And, you know, fast forward through to this latest book, which is also under the same name, Delivering the Digital Restaurant, but but now it's called The Path to Digital Maturity, which is a, 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 accompanies the first book rather well, because this is more of a playbook. This has got tips and hints and worksheets at the back of every chapter to try and help restaurants now recognize, now that we're past the pandemic, to say, look, through the pandemic, you had a spray and pray strategy. You had to react very quickly. You had to deploy technology all across your your environment. And now perhaps you aren't in a place where you need all that technology. Perhaps you need to actually focus in on what's most important to you for where you are on the path to digital maturity. And so we're trying to help the restaurant find their position and then also think about how to optimize their position on that to then progress forwards. And the the whole idea of the book is perhaps it's the how to the first book's why. And um, I'm hoping those that get a chance to read it will have um, a much clearer idea and, again, some best practices to be able to really continue to optimize the off-premise channel and the general ethos of how digitizing the restaurant um, operating model is something that can really um, change the, the restaurant industry for the better. When I, when I think about the restaurant industry, right, um, innovation, disruption doesn't really come to mind in the first, you know, let's say 10 terms that I think of, right? And, but, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's an industry that if you don't evolve, you, you, it's really hard to survive long term. I mean, the percentage of restaurants that open up and eventually close is very, very high. It's really tough to keep that going, especially in a, in a very competitive, hyper-competitive world right now. How, how has the reception been uh, in your experience with restaurants when it comes to talking about the need to understand the technology, to understand the analytics? and the data. And that, that's what Juicer is all about, where you are now. You, you were the co-founder and you're serving as the chief operating officer at Juicer. 
it, how, how hard has it been to, to kind of hit home the importance of including, incorporating data and analytics into those restaurant, you know, strategies? Wow, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> and look, it, it's the it's the central theme of everything I've dedicated my life to over the last four or five years. It, it's uh, it's tough because again, why do restaurateurs open up restaurants? They love food, they love hospitality, they love seeing the joy in their customers' faces. In my world of digital off-premise um, channels, they get to create the food, they don't get to see the customers' joy in their faces. Right. And so it, what kind of experience are they getting from it? And so you have to get to a place to actually help the restaurant understand that actually by going down this pathway, by actually embracing the fact that customers want to experience their food sometimes, sometimes outside of the dining room is actually something that's going to be an incremental source of value to your business. This absolutely isn't about replacing the dining experience. Everyone's still going to want to have date night on a Friday night. But these moments for off-premise are about the Tuesday lunchtime when you're running from meeting to meeting to meeting, or the Thursday night when both you and your, your partner are getting in late from work and you need to get something ready for the kids. That's what off-premise is trying to serve. It's that convenient moment. And sometimes people just don't want to cook either because of the time involved. And you know, we, we touch in the first book about just the change in American family and, and the way in which actually many families now have both you know, but both uh, the couple are actually out to work. And so it's a different landscape, very different to the generations before us. And more importantly, now I think because of digitization and because of the data that you mentioned, Ken, that actually customers are becoming far more aware of the food that they want to put into their body. They're becoming more demanding about the type of food they want in their body, the nutritional profile of what they're actually going to try and work towards, whether it be for political reasons, personal, environmental. People are making all sorts of decisions because of the celebrity chefs and the cooking shows that we've all grown up watching over the last 15, 20 years. People know a lot more about food now than what they did before. And so through digital channels, you're getting far more culinary curiosity available to be serviced than whatever you could actually set up in a brick and mortar restaurant in the traditional manner. That comes through in things like virtual brands. You know, I was at the national uh, this national restaurant show this week with um, in Chicago, and uh, a lady called Pinky Cole, who was a former uh, producer on the Today Show, is now a restaurateur, and she's created this concept called Slutty Vegan. Hmm. Slutty Vegan. Now, well, that's, <laughs> that sounds interesting, right? She's got things on the menu like one night stand, <laughs> and she text messages these uh, the, to her customers. Um, you know somewhat um, contentious text messages uh, on things, which drives a lot of theater, drives a lot of fun and experience, which drives a lot of social media sharing, which drives a lot of attention to that one brand that has probably less than 10 locations in the US right now. I think they're centered in Atlanta, but they're doing that in such a way that creates a different form of connection to the customer than what you, you traditionally have. You know, you think traditionally of a restaurant and sometimes you're thinking food. And if you're in the mall and you're walking past a particular restaurant, what do you want to eat? And you walk in. Now restaurants can use digital channels to connect to their customers. They can build an understanding of their customers in such a way. And, I, and there's another lady called Lucy Logan up in Santa Barbara that's created this company. And she was showing me this thing of Outback, that if you're gluten intolerant, the entire Outback menu just dissipates to only the items that you can eat. If Now that's, that's, That's using pretty amazing. Yeah, to create right, exactly. a customized menu. Yeah, ultimate you know, Taco, customization. Taco, yeah. Taco Bell these days have a, a kiosk where you can swipe a little thing along to be able to say, I just want the vegetarian mode. Right, right. All of these things are helping create a more customized uh, experience for the end guest. And as long as the restaurants can build a model that allows them to service their guests how they want to be and be where their customers are, wherever they are, not always necessarily in the restaurant, is going to enable them to be able to actually avoid the, the, the terrible loss that we see in restaurants. You know, the turnover that we see in restaurants is pretty poor. We sure. lost 100,000 of them right. in the pandemic. But maybe it's a bit like a wildfire. Yeah, maybe this exactly. is actually laying out the, the place for places like Slutty Vegan now to grow and become the restaurants of the future. Um, and it's super, super exciting. So I'm, I'm curious when you are, and you mentioned uh, social media a few moments ago as well. I'm curious when, you, when you're when you out there talking to restaurants, right? Is it, 
I'm, I'm trying to get my head around kind of who it is you talk to, right? Who, who in that restaurant organization is going to be receptive to what you're talking about? Is it the technologist? If it's a larger chain, for example, like Taco Bell or Texas Roadhouse or whoever it might be, is it more the individual GM of that one restaurant? Uh, who, who, who is it that you're speaking to, to kind of get your message across? And then my follow-on question is, then where do those folks hang out in social media? How do you use the social media to get the attention of that audience as well? So uh, the role of digitization in technology is not the responsibility of the CTO. I'll say that again. The role of responsibility in digitization is not the responsibility of the CTO, which sure. makes people go, what the heck? What do, you, what do you want about? Of course it is. It's not. Every single function now actually has digitization through it. Now, the CTO is going to help make the right choices. It's going to help implement it, of course. But every function now has to embrace digitization in different ways, whether it be through employee scheduling software for the COO, through to inventory control processes that the CFO might be more interested in, through to the social media tools and outreach campaigns through text messaging capability that the CMO might be interested in. And then, of course, on the ground, the GMs absolutely need to be interested in it as well because they need to be deploying a lot of these technologies and feeding back what's working and what's not and saying what they need support for. Um, and ultimately, they're going to be supporting the customers as well. And to the second part of your question about how do you reach them? Well, again, everyone has an interest in food. Everyone is connected to food in some right, way. Right. And so any form of social media, whether it be on a TikTok video celebrating the latest LTO or in the kitchen of a restaurant's um, new, new kind of cooking process or new cooking equipment, all of these things play into social media and being able to have some form of connection. And so it's tough to find, you know, to use social media and to be able to do it. But a lot of it is content is king, lots of content and trying to be genuine or authentic. Again, I would invite people to look at the Slutty Vegan Instagram, for example, to see what I mean by that. This isn't about just taking lots of beautiful photos or promotional posters and putting it onto your Instagram profile. This is about being true to the character as if you were to humanize your brand and to put it in such a way that allows someone to go, I wanna be friends with that brand. I want them to know me and me to know them. And if they do that, then it's about them engaging through social just as if it was a human person. I love that. That's that's a fantastic uh, metaphor to kind of think about. And what comes to mind is that movie, The Chef, right? From what, 2016, 2018 with, with uh, John Favreau. And, you know, as they're driving their food truck around, you know, all throughout the South, then they're doing a lot of that. They're they're creating that brand of that truck and the chefs themselves. Uh, and his whatever 10, 12 year old, you know, son is the one doing all the posting. But yeah, I mean, like you said, creating, that's really ideally what any business wants is to create a brand that really resonates with their audience, with their customer base, and then finding a way to really kind of share that message and get it out there, but to be genuine and be authentic and also be consistent, right? You can't, you can't be the, the, the slutty vegan and you're talking about, you know, all these high fat type, you know, type uh, recipes, right? Um, there's obviously got to be some continuity there. So you've got to be consistent with who your brand is or what your brand is um, to make sure that the messaging is, is getting out to the right audience and, and telling the right story also. Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah, look, it's um, this whole space, Ken, is is fascinating. You know, my, my um, business that I co-founded with the, the team eighteen months ago, Inducer, is is trying to explore again another form of innovation with pricing, right? So many restaurants use a very blunt instrument when it comes to pricing. Over the last year, I'm sure many of your listeners will have seen just the fact that many restaurants have increased their prices once or twice, maybe three times. But what they typically do is it's a flat increase on their, right. their base menu. Sure, sure. And and what we're trying to say is like, well, actually, there's a lot of data out there that can inform you to actually do this differently. And, you know, a lot of this gets put under the banner of dynamic pricing. But honestly, a lot of this is just using data to make smarter pricing decisions. Right. To be able to say, you know, maybe some people will pay an extra dollar for this item. But, you know, when you look at your competitor base over here that have just changed their prices, maybe you should keep your prices the same. Or actually on Mondays at 3 p.m. to drive a bit of extra volume, maybe you should have a dollar off here to that particular item. There are there are ways to be able to use data and, and elasticity to be able to help you understand where prices should change for each location, for each item of the menu, for each day part. And what we're doing, my co-founders have had a lot of experience in travel and hospitality and hotels. What we're trying to do is be able to bring that experience from hotels 
and deploy it into to restaurants and restaurant menus so that again we're, you're empowering the customer to have choice you know one of the things that sometimes is very rarely talked about here is now that digitization off-premise has become so prevalent that many restaurants are struggling operationally to satisfy the amount of orders that are going through their kitchen. These kitchens were designed for on-premise, right? They were designed for the, the amount of tables that they typically have and the, the, the turn time of those tables. And now this entire new channel has come on where suddenly you've got this surge of orders at one point, even perhaps when the dining tables are empty. But for restaurants that are seeing the, the, tiny, the, the dining tables are full and they get that surge, they do this thing called throttling where they turn off their, on, their off-premise channels. Sometimes they forget to turn them back on. But by doing that, they're doing the opposite of what I experienced with Raymo and Grace. They're not giving you hospitality. They're for all intents and purposes closing their digital doors in your face and saying, nope, not open for business. Now that would never happen in an on-premise world. In an on-premise world, you'd be saying, well, here are the menus, we'll probably be another half hour. So if you'd like to go to the bar and have, take a look and I'll ask the barman to serve you a free drink. That, that's what you're used to at, at a place that I remember when you'd go to Raymo and Grace's. In the digital world, you need to empower the customer to have a choice. And so when it comes to pricing, we're saying, well, at those peaks, if your items are perhaps just a dollar more, then you're giving the customer the choice. Well, if you want to eat at this restaurant tonight and are willing to pay a little bit more, then we'll give you that choice. But then perhaps for the more value-orientated customer, the one that actually wants to get a deal, if they perhaps order at 5 p.m. on a Monday night as opposed to 6 p.m., maybe they get some form of incentive. And over time, we're going to educate consumers, I think, to be able to see that actually this is about empowering choice. This isn't about Taylor Swift surge pricing because every restaurant we work within is about saying, no, there needs to be a defined range because scarcity is an important word in this space. In the hotel and travel space, or when you've got the need to have a flight somewhere, you know there's only a certain amount of flights or times you're able to operate in. When you're in a restaurant environment, you're one and one or two clicks away from an alternative option that will, that will do just fine. So managing pricing is somewhat different to hotels and airlines. But similarly, there's opportunity and there's money being left on the table to be able to do this more effectively. And so, you know, the, the innovation, I guess, whether it be through pricing or robotics or AI, all of these things continue to move forward and restaurants are continuing to have to play catch up alongside them. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's an industry that really hasn't, like I said earlier, hasn't really been known for being the most innovative out there too. So it's kind of a double whammy they have. So you, so you, you maybe you kind of answered this question a little bit already in the past. You talked about how much you have a passion for variety. Uh, you talked about kind of having that forward thinking mindset as well. But you know, one of the things I love asking all of our guests on the podcast is, you know, what are what are the phrases or words that you use to kind of describe yourself? Right. For me, obviously, the practical optimist, which is the name of the book and the podcast. But it's you know, like you describe, I get the practical side from my mom, who is you know a little bit less risk tolerant, um, a brilliant woman, very intelligent and, and very forward thinking also. Um, and my dad was more the optimist, right? He was the visionary. He was kind of like your mom, the person that you know loved to talk to people and engage and hear stories and be the one scheduling parties and get together, that kind of thing. So those two things kind of come together for me as a practical optimist. I'm curious about yourself. How would you describe Carl, you know, in those few kind of uh, words also? Wow. You know what? I, I haven't ever really thought about it. Um, I mean, I would hope and this doesn't necessarily have uh, the, 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 the lovely language that you put behind your own description, but I would hope when people describe me, they think that I was there to help and that I'm always there to try and support, um, whether it be individuals that are working me, with me uh, in my own teams or those that I'm trying to support in the industry that I helped and I was able to you know, drive a conversation that needed to be had. I love it. No, that's great. That's great. And that's the good thing about the question is that there's no right or wrong answer, right? It's just whatever, whatever kind of fits in for you also. So I'm curious. So as we wrap up here, what, what, what's on your career matrix now, right? You've got your podcast going, uh, which mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've listened to and, and actually seen because it's, it's a video podcast, right? I've seen a number of episodes where, where do you want to take that? And you know, what's, what's on your matrix now going forward? Yeah, the Digital Restaurant Podcast is, is doing great. It's in the top 100 of business podcasts around many countries of the world, which blows my mind, quite honestly. Well, um, congratulations. And people uh, should check it out also. It's, it's called the, the, the Digital, the digital uh, Restaurant, Restaurant Podcast. Yeah, and it's it's five. We just, Meredith and I talk about five headlines that have affected the world of restaurants, off-premise and technology. 
And it's basically to help people that just don't have time, just get up to speed of all the change that's happening. Yeah. Well, back, um, back to what you said a few minutes ago about, about you know, you want to help people. You, you would hope that people would describe you as somebody who is supportive and helpful of them. I think that the podcast is a great example of that. That's right. Yeah. And it, and look, it, it, there is a self-serving element to it as well, because it keeps us up to speed, right? To put something on like that, you have to, therefore, keep up to speed. <laughs> right. That's for sure. So exactly. It, it, it certainly helps. Um, what next? <sighs> really good question. Like, for me, I've always wanted to have uh, my own business. And so to have co-founded this business, Inducer, alongside three incredible co-founders, that folks that have built and sold businesses. You know, our, our chairman um, was the founding CMO at Kayak. He built uh, Jetsetter.com. You know, amazing guys. Wow. Yeah, are yeah. Not only good business people, but also good people. Um, that's super important to me. It's not, so, and I, you know, I know with the theme of what we talk about on this podcast is important, but or, or I would really encourage your listeners, if they're on the cusp of making a career decision, even a great idea of a, of a company or, or a business that you really love, if you don't connect with the people that you're going to be working with, walk away. It's really important to have that connection and, and that two-way interview process, if you want to make sure there's the right fit. Because certainly when I, I met Ashwin, who's our CEO and, and co-founder, He's one of the most humble and transparent people out there. And I, I love the way in which he goes about um, just telling his story. And that rubs off on you as well. So what do I want for the future? Well, I want to be able to continue to you know, become a better leader. I want to become even more helpful in supporting our industry as it co continues to, to grapple with digitization. I want to write a West End musical. I want to write maybe another book one day. Maybe I want to create my own board game called Delivering the Digital Restaurant. Who knows? But, <laughs> I love it. But the point is, is that um, with, you know, I, I sit on four or five different advisory boards helping those companies grow. If one of these companies or my own company gets to a place where we get a, a suitably effective liquidation that allows me to then make maybe other choices around how I spend my time, yeah, I'll put it to more creative pursuits and I will then continue to support businesses and, and help them find you know their best fit for, for the industry that they serve. And so that would be a, a nice outcome, being able to continue to be an advisor and support the industry. Well, I think it's, it certainly is consistent with what you said about yourself kind of early on in your career that you realized, and even during your university days, that you realized you love variety, right? When you're talking about everything from a board game to starting new companies to who knows what else, um, or, or, or writing that uh, that that uh, script that you're talking about also, that's fantastic. It is about variety. I think that's what I love about this also and what, what I do is that getting exposed to so many different industries and sectors and leaders like yourself that, you know, it, it makes you realize there's not one way to get to the end game. There's a thousand different ways to get there in different paths. It's just a matter of what's right for you. Right. And again, like you talked about the restaurant staying consistent with their brand, you as an individual also have to stay consistent you know, and authentic with your own brand. Otherwise, you know, it's going to be very obvious very quickly that, you know what, <laughs> this is this is sounding very forced. So I appreciate you sharing that. Any last uh, comments you want to share with our listeners? And I do want to make sure people can get a hold of you if they have if they have questions that they want to learn more, or obviously pick up a copy of your book. So maybe you can kind of share the best way for them to sure. uh, to contact you. Yeah, well, thank you for having me on, Ken. Uh, best place for folks to get the book is either going to our website directly at uh, the, the uh, well, you could get it two different ways. It's delivering the digital restaurant.com or going to the digital dot restaurant. Um, or, of course, if you'd like to go to a certain small retailer out there called Amazon, you can get a Kindle version. The first book I, I read through Audible, if you want me to read the book to you, the, the Audible version of the second book comes out uh, next month as well. Um, so yeah, would love to hear from you. And of course, come to our website, register for the podcast and, and reach out to me on LinkedIn. Yeah, it's great. People can kind of kill uh, two birds with one stone by going to your podcast and, and subscribing and coming to our podcast and subscribing as well, which is great. So a good variety of content. So thank you so much. I appreciate not only just your, your insights about the industry and what you're doing at Juicer, but also just, you know, willingness to talk about the, uh, you know, your upbringing and the vulnerability side too. So uh, we really appreciate hearing that. Thanks, Ken. Thanks for having me on. Wonderful. All right. Thanks so much.